Come on, somebody. You know, joy is one of the vital gauges in our life. Uh, Our joy is a big deal. It's important to God. And and literally, when you think about your life, you kind of like take a second and just reflect on that dashboard on your car. Uh, Joy, it's it's something that we need to keep our eyes on. We need to measure. You know, when when you start seeing these uh, lights on your dashboard go off, uh, these lights are telling you things, right? Uh, and if you're like most people, um, these lights go off and maybe you don't know exactly what all of them mean or what the problem is when you see the check engine light come on or, or, or some other kind of light come on. Like I love the one right here where it looks like someone's getting hit in the face with a dodgeball. That's like my favorite one. <laughs> I'm always like, that's an amazing light. It's like, did that person actually get hit in the face with a dodgeball right there? And they're strapped in. Like, you can't get away from that dodgeball. It's going to hit you straight in the face. Um, but no, it's, it's when, when these gauges or these warning lights start going off on our dashboard, we would pay attention to them. And we should pay attention to them to some degree, obviously, because that means there's some issues with the car. But I, I want to pose to you today that I think it's the same with our joy. I think it's the exact same thing when it comes to our joy. We should be asking ourselves this question. When the lights are going off on the dashboard of our life, when we're not experiencing joy, when we've lost our joy, when we're not really uh, feeling joy-filled in our life, we really have two options. Um, Again, it it would be, okay, what am I going to do about it? Number one, I'm going to completely ignore it. I'm going to say... Pull your bootstraps up and get over it. Come on, you got to keep going. That's what I'm gonna. That's what I'm gonna tell myself. I'm gonna look in the mirror, or I'm really gonna get to the root of the matter, and that's what I would love to do today. I would love to really get to the root of the matter instead of just having you or me look in the mirror and say, "Hey, pull your bootstraps up if you're not feeling joyful. It's okay. It's called life. It's called adulting, right? Woo! This is fun. No, listen." I think we need to get to the root of the issue when it comes to joy. And I believe today that God can do some pretty extraordinary things in our life if we'll be brave enough, honest enough, courageous enough to go on this journey. So will you pray with me before we get started? God, today as we dive into this topic, as we dig into your word, we know we're going to hear some some challenging things today. But God, I just pray that you would help us today. First off, to figure out what the, what the current temperature is of our joy in life. But beyond that, God, that you would help us really get to the root of that matter. To get to the heart of that issue. Because I know today that you want to do an extraordinary work in our hearts and in our lives today. So we don't just go through the motions in another weekend, another time together. No, God, we believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you're working in our hearts and in our lives today, and you are after our joy. So help us discover it, Jesus. We need you. Holy Spirit, work in our life today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. You know, I think one of the the biggest issues we have with joy is we often confuse joy and happiness. We often confuse joy and happiness. We just heard it on that video. Right? When you're asked the question, you know, what, what does your joy look like? Or what does it look like to have joy? People start giving all kinds of different answers. You know, they say, um, time with my family. They say, a spreadsheet is my joy. They say, I walked in and there was a sale at, the, at my favorite store. And I walked up to the rack and I found clothes there. And, and man, that's, that's what brings me joy. But the truth is, I think oftentimes in our life, we confuse joy and happiness. We confuse these two things. And we're not really sure necessarily why they get confused. Maybe to some degree they're related. I would say probably you could, you could go that far. But I think if you dig into Scripture, what you're going to find out is that these two things are distinctly different. They are uniquely different. God made them different for A reason. So let me give you a couple of thoughts on that. Two things to distinguish joy from happiness. First thing, 
Happiness is a matter of chance. Joy is a matter of choice. Happiness is a matter of chance. Joy is a matter of choice. What does that mean? Well, that, that means this. I'm happy when my team wins. Come on, somebody. Right? When my team wins, I'm happy. But when my team loses, I am not happy. Right? When I get the promotion at work, woohoo! I'm happy. When they tell me they went with someone else and I didn't get the promotion, I'm not happy. Happiness is a matter of chance. I really can't, like, like it's directly tied to things which I essentially have no control of. But joy is a matter of choice. What does that mean? Well, let me try to put this in a nutshell. Joy is a choice because joy is an emotion based on salvation. Joy is an emotion based on salvation. It's the joy of seeing, knowing, loving, and trusting Jesus Christ no matter the outcomes in my life. There's a distinct difference there. My happiness is affected by certain things, but again, my joy is a choice, choosing to have joy in any situation in my life. Now, what makes that confusing for us, and Scripture is very clear about this, Galatians 5.22, we don't have time to to dig into that, but if you want to look it up uh, and you're writing these down or writing notes down today, Galatians 5.22 tells us this, the only thing that produces joy in your life is the Holy Spirit. That's it. Real, true, lasting joy. The only thing that can make real joy, manufacture real joy in your life and mine, is God's Spirit at work inside of us. The fruits of the Spirit are this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You and I have none of those without God's Spirit at work in our lives. We can't generate joy by ourselves. So that, that makes that a little bit confusing for us sometimes. Joy is this divine gladness. It's deep delight in Jesus. Again, it's seeing, knowing, loving, and trusting the salvation of Jesus and the sovereignty of God, no matter the outcomes or situations that I find myself in. Again, happiness is a matter of chance. Joy is a matter of choice. Second thing, happiness is driven by my circumstance. Joy is driven by Jesus. Period. Period. <laughs> happy is driven by my circumstance. Remember the song? Well, I'm happy, clap along if you feel. Come on, remember? Yeah. <laughs> I think you might need to do that. Come on, let's do it. Come on. Clap along if you feel. Come on, we're going to get our joy back today. Come on, ready? Clap along if you feel. Happiness is the truth. <laughs> clap along if you feel. All right, we can stop. Sorry. Happiness is driven by my circumstance. Joy is driven by Jesus. My happy is directly tied to my circumstance in life. If life is going well, if if life is good, things are stable, my bank account is full, I'm having no health issues, my relationships are hitting on all cylinders, and there are clear forecasts in, in the world around me today, Boy, that just makes me happy. But do you notice that when any of those things are messed up, that our happy is messed up? Come on, somebody. Yeah, when when any of those things are are a wreck, right? If life is bad, if things are unstable, if my bank account is empty, if my health is failing me, if my relationships are on the struggle bus, if I'm just struggling in my relationships— And if it's cold outside and cloudy with a chance of whatever, you can believe that my happiness will be affected. But joy is steady. Joy is steady. It's not an up and down type thing. It's a steady thing because the source of joy is steady. The source of joy is steady. You can't have true joy outside of Jesus. Knowing Jesus, loving Jesus, trusting Jesus, spending time with Jesus and allowing him to lead us to his best for our lives. That's where, that's where joy comes from. I didn't make that up. It's right here in the Bible. Psalm 1611 says this. You make known to me the path of life in your presence. 
there is fullness of joy. Where do you find joy? In your presence. When I am with or around Jesus, that is where my joy is stirred up. That is where I find joy, the presence of Jesus. Wherever Jesus is, joy comes with him. Amen? Wherever Jesus is, joy comes with him. That's why when you walk in here on Sunday, you're like, man, I don't know why. I I walk into church. I feel so good. I feel so good. But then Monday happens. Right? Who's with me? You're like, I feel so good. I get around people, and, and we're, we're around the people of God. Well, again, the Bible says where two or three of you gather in his name, Jesus is there. Jesus said that. So it's not like we got to go looking for Jesus. If there's more than two or three of us gathered here in his name, guess what, gang? He's here. He's here. So in his presence is where we find joy. That's why we start to get some joy. We get some wind in our sails when we come and gather together with folks at church. And, and when, when we spend time with people, um, again, that, that are pursuing God in their life, it's because we're, we're in the presence of Jesus. That's where there's fullness of joy. All right, so let's recap. Happiness is by chance. It's driven by circumstance. Joy is by choice. It's driven by Jesus. So let me ask you a question. What is stealing your joy? What's stealing your joy? Now that you know the difference between the two, I think you could ask yourself a very practical question. Do you have joy in your life? Do you have this constant stream of joy that's active in your life because of time in the presence of Jesus where you're getting wind in your sails? Or is your joy doing like the stock market <laughs> right now? Is it, is it up and down and, and all over the place? Because if it is, like today, we need to ask ourselves, what is it? What is it? What's the issue? What's the problem with my joy? I, I, this passage stuck out to me this week because obviously there's a lot of things in Scripture that talk about problems that can arise with our joy. Struggles, troubles, things. But this particular dialogue that Jesus had with his disciples really intrigued me. He said this in Mark 4, 19. He said, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things... They come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. What does that mean? That means you can walk into church and get all the word that you want to get. You can walk in here and and you can get all the word that you want to get on a Sunday morning. You can wake up every single day of your life and get all the word that you want to get in your life. You can have your face buried in this word. You can think that you're living and relying and trusting in this word. But what Jesus himself said is this. There are three things that will choke your joy. Three things right here that will absolutely choke your joy. The worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things. It will, those, those three things will literally choke the joy out of your life. Let's talk about those for a second. Because I'm guessing today, if maybe you're struggling with your joy or you're considering your joy today, I'm guessing you'll probably find yourself in one or more of these categories. First thing that steals your joy or chokes your joy, anxious thoughts steal your joy. And a hush fell over the crowd. Anxious thoughts steal your joy. Boy, there's a lot of anxious thoughts in the world today. Would you agree? Whoo. Oh, Lord. Our country, the economy, the stock market, our government. I hear a lot of people that have a lot of things going through their minds these days 
that are anxious. Anxious. I, I've got these anxious thoughts flowing around in my head. Do you, do you know what anxious thoughts are? Those are thoughts about things you can't control but are completely unwilling to lay at God's feet. I'm going to say that again. Anxious thoughts are thoughts about things that you have absolutely no control over, but you are completely, I am completely unwilling to lay them at God's feet. Burdens that are too heavy for me to carry, but I won't put them down. (laughs) I won't ask God to help me carry them. I'll just keep trying to carry them. I'll shoulder up, right? I'll buckle up. I'll I'll, I'll bite my lip and make it happen. When the worry, the fear, and the anxiousness comes, and that list just goes on and on, all those things that are in my head that I, I can't control, I don't have any control over these things, but yet I'm just completely unwilling to lay them down at God's feet. That's why Paul the Apostle, a man who was shipwrecked, imprisoned for his faith, and many other things, beaten publicly even, for living out his faith in Jesus. That's why he said these words about anxious thinking. Philippians 4, he said this. Do not be anxious about anything. Why did Paul say that? Because he knew that anxious thoughts would steal your joy. He said, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving in your heart, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul learned a secret. He learned that his anxious thoughts were stealing his joy. Paul, the guy that when he, when he was locked up in a prison cell <laughs> and, and, and the jailer um, came and Paul and Silas are in there. Paul's in prison. What is he doing while he's in prison? He's worshiping. He's singing to Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, when I hear that story, I'm like, I don't know that I'd be singing to Jesus if I was locked up in a prison cell. Paul was. What did he know that we don't? What what does he understand that, that we don't understand? And it's not just Paul. What about David? David, a man who's, again, his life had plenty of reason for him to have anxious thoughts. He had a, a dysfunctional relationship with his kids. He cheated on his wife. He had the, the, the man uh, of the woman that he cheated on his wife with uh, sent to the front lines and killed. He had a lot of reasons to be anxious. But David in Psalm 55, 22, running for his life even and hiding in caves, he said this. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Anxious thoughts will steal your joy, period. If you want joy, you have to choose to do something with those anxious thoughts. Second thing, deferred hopes. Deferred hopes will steal your joy. If you have a hope in your life or a longing in your life that is not being fulfilled today, that will steal your joy. Proverbs 13, 12 says this, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. If you have deferred hopes in your heart today, whatever those hopes are, if they're being deferred in this moment, that is what's stealing your joy. Plain and simple in scripture, looking but not finding experiencing, but, but never finding the fulfillment. Again, I'm thinking about things like grief and loneliness and letdown. All of these things, they can steal your joy. But the second part of that scripture is so big. It says, a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. A longing fulfilled is a tree of life. What does that mean? Well, I should ask myself this question. Where are my longings being fulfilled? Is my career fulfilling my longings? Is is the stock market fulfilling my longings? (laughs) Is the government fulfilling my longings? Is a trusted friend or a leader, 
are they always fulfilling my longings? Come on, the truth is this. If you've lived long enough, I'm sure that you know by now, promises made by any of these people, places, or things are promises that will be broken. You've had a government that will promise you things and then break those promises. You've had leaders or friends that will promise you things and then break those promises. You've had a career promise you things, but then break those promises or a stock market. You know, again, wealth in your life. You've seen that. You've experienced it. So you know exactly what it means to lose your joy when it comes to that. So we can't nor should we ever put our, all that weight to fulfill our longings in those areas. This isn't in the notes for today, but I just read this yesterday and I, I put this in here because I thought this was so good. 2 Corinthians 1.20. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen ascends to the glory of his glory. What does that mean? That means... Jesus is the promise keeper. Jesus is the one that fulfills every longing in life. Every promise of God is fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. Now, let me be clear. That doesn't mean that things are always going to work out like you hope they will. Because you have some hopes in your life Jesus is the promise keeper. That doesn't mean everything will work out exactly like you hope it will. What it means is it will work out though. It means that God will work this together for good. All right, here we go. Anxious thoughts, deferred hopes, last thing that steals our joy, wandering hearts. Wandering hearts steal your joy. A heart that's never satisfied, that's always trying to fill the emptiness with something other than Jesus. We do that. We're actually pretty good at it, right? We try to fill those empty longings inside of our hearts with money and possessions and things and relationships and hobbies and business pursuits. And we try to go after happiness. But the truth is, in all of that, we're not finding joy. There's only one thing in our heart that could ever fulfill that. David knew this. He knew that his heart would wander. Psalm 51, he said this, Psalm 51, 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit within me. What does that mean? That means David is saying, restore to me the joy of your salvation. My heart is wandering a little right now, God. I've gotten off track a little bit. I'm finding my fulfillment in other things. I need to get back to finding my fulfillment in Jesus. That's what I need to get back. And then he said, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. What's that mean? Well, sometimes I'm just not willing. <laughs> Anybody else? Just me? Where you're like, I know what I should do. I know I should spend time with Jesus today, but I'm busy. Right? Right? I know I should uh, make, make it a point to pray today, to talk to God today, but I'm not in the mood to do that. I don't feel like doing that. David's saying when you feel that way, you, you need to consider that maybe your heart is wandering. And in that moment, you would discover this is what's stealing your joy. You have to give all of your heart to Jesus. You can't give part of your heart, some of your heart. You can't give half of your heart. Remember that John Mayer song? Half of my heart. Tips. Oh, I don't know what the words are. Situation, half of my heart. Tips. That's what he, if you listen to the words of this song, the half of my heart song, what John Mayer is saying is this. I'm trying to give half of my heart to something or somebody, and it just keeps leaving me confused, conflicted. And there's literally a line in the song that says this. I can't keep loving you with half of my heart. If I'm only going to love you with half of my heart, it's just, it's confusing. It's conflicting. And, and again, it is stealing my joy. I have to give all of my heart to Jesus. Anxious thoughts, deferred hopes, wandering hearts. So today, my question for you is this. 
Do you have any of those? <laughs> Maybe you have more than one of them. <laughs> so I heard someone say, I have all of them. Yes, we do. These are the things which are stealing our joy. But I got good news for you today. Jesus knows that. He knows that. He, he shared this with us for the purpose of, he gave us his word for the purpose of us being able to get free from those things. So I'm going to give you just a couple thoughts here as we wrap this message up today. How do I find joy or get it back if I've lost it? Come on, if that's you today and you're like, yep, I'm in, I, I need to, I want to find joy or I've lost it. If you, if you are saying that's the question I want answered today, come on, show me your hand right now. Across this place. Yeah, good. It's good. Yeah. I want to know how to get it back. I want to know what it means if I've lost it. What does that look like? Well, I think the first thing and probably the most important thing that you can do if you want to get your joy back in life is this. I have to let all roads lead me to Jesus. How many roads? All, all roads lead me to Jesus. Why? Why is that so important? What are you saying, Jason? What, what do you mean all roads lead me to Jesus? Well, well, hear me say this today. Every road that leads me to Jesus leads me to joy. Every road, every single road, God bless the broken road that led me straight. I don't know. I got music going through my head today. I don't know what it is. Some rascal flats in there, right? This is, this is key. This is true. Every road that leads me to Jesus leads me to joy. So what does that mean? That means if the road is broken, if the road is busted, if the road is good, bad, ugly, or otherwise, if I will make the choice in my life to let every road lead me to Jesus, then I will have joy in life. I didn't make this up. Every road that leads me to Jesus leads me to joy. Anxiousness, worry, fear, hardship in life, struggle, pain, hurt, health issues, wondering, searching, chasing hearts, busted relationships. If you want joy in your life, all roads have to lead to Jesus. Again, I didn't say it. James, the brother of Jesus, he said this, and I've read this passage so many times and not really even understood what he was completely really trying to say here. He said this, consider it pure joy. James 1, 2, consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. I remember reading that and thinking, what was James smoking that day? James had the headbanger boogie out or something. I don't know. I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? Consider it the purest form of joy in your life. When you face trials and struggles and troubles and hurts and pain and worry, you're thinking like, James is sick. Just a sick human being. No, no, no. What is James saying here? He's just simply saying this. If you want joy in your life, all roads have to lead to Jesus. The good roads, boy, when we're on the mountaintops, that's when we really think that we see Jesus, yeah? It's, you know, when we're dancing through the lilies. I had a friend that sent me a picture the other day. <laughs> he, he was at, it was, it was the Mayan ruins. He had climbed up to the top of the, the Mayan ruins. He sent me this picture, this selfie. And he looked, you know, again, so joyful and happy. And that's what we do. We take those pictures and he's standing on top of the world in that moment. And, and I just was thinking to myself, you know, the truth is I've never really needed Jesus on the top of the mountain. Come on, somebody. I mean, I did need Jesus, but the truth is, in my heart, I didn't really feel like I needed Jesus. I felt like things were going good. I was at the top of the mountain, at the top of the heap. I, I, things were good. I mean, that was that moment, my selfie pose, right? 
So this is why James is saying this. He's saying if you want joy in your life, you have to consider it the purest joy possible. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So let perseverance finish its work. Why? Why do I need to let this happen? Why do I need to let these roads, all these roads lead me to Jesus? Well, if you want joy, all roads have to lead to him because he's doing a work inside of you. And you have to let him finish that work so that you may become, here's the word, mature, complete, not lacking anything. Not lacking anything. Highest of highs, lowest of lows. Paul said, I know what it means to be, you know, to be well fed and hungry. I know what it means to have a lot and have a little. This is what he's saying. He's saying, literally, James has got the same heart here. Happiness may be destroyed by my circumstance, but my joy will not be destroyed by my circumstance. It's not going to happen that way because all roads lead me to Jesus. Romans 5, Paul said this, Rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. Hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to, who he has given to us. Hear me say this today. This is big. True joy can never be destroyed by trouble. True joy is deepened by trouble. That's what James is saying. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying, listen, true joy in your life, if you want to know what joy is, if you want to know if you've got it, if you want to know that God's joy is in you and giving you strength, and, and again, it's the source of your strength in your life, it comes down to this, this question. Anytime I face hardships or trouble in life, I'll ask myself this question. Will this destroy my joy or will it deepen my joy? Come on, somebody. We need to write that down today. We need to think about that this week when you're turning on whatever preferred news channel that you want to watch and those anxious thoughts are going through your head. When those hopes in your heart are deferred and your heart is starting to get sick, when your heart's kind of wondering, you need to ask yourself this question. Will I let this destroy my joy or will I let this deepen my joy? It's a choice. I get the choice. My joy can be destroyed by this or my, do- my joy can be deepened by this. Again, remember Psalm 1611. You show me the path of life in your presence. There is fullness of joy. Joy is the byproduct of being in the presence of Jesus. If all roads lead me to Jesus, then I can choose that all roads will lead me to joy. Not having joy in my life, it's a trial. It's what the enemy wants. It's human nature when we, we're not feeling joy in our life to distance ourselves from God. But will this thing I'm going through right now, will this drive me deeper into the arms of Jesus? Or will this destroy my relationship with Jesus? What will this do? Even though I walk away from God, take joy in this today, church. Even though we pull away from God in hard times, he never pulls away from us. Never pulls away from us. He's after your joy today. And if you make the choice to be deepened by your circumstance today and not destroyed by letting all roads lead to Jesus, I promise you this, you will find joy in your life. How do you get it back? You have to let all roads lead to Jesus. And the last thing, you have to remain. You have to keep showing up. You have to never miss twice. Remain, keep showing up, never miss twice. Nothing will change in our life without the decision to remain. Jesus is not a band-aid for my joy. He's the source of my joy. Sometimes I put the Jesus Band-Aid on Sunday on. You know what I'm saying? 
I come in with some bumps and bruises from a hard week. And I'm like, ooh, I need me some Jesus Band-Aids. Right? Where's some Jesus Band-Aids at? I got some, I'm bumped up here. I got some busted up knees. I need some of them Jesus Band-Aids. Jesus never intended to be a Band-Aid for your joy. He's the source of your joy. That's something totally different. It's not a Band-Aid solution. He's the source. Look, he said it himself, John 15. He said, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine. You're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. (laughs) He pretty much cut to the chase there, didn't he? He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you will be like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you these things so that my joy could be in you and so that your joy could be complete. How many times did you hear the word remain in that couple paragraphs from Jesus? He kept saying this, I know you're going to come to me for Band-Aids. I know. You're going to come to me like the school nurse. Yes? You got to come in. On, I need some Band-Aids. I'm bumped up. I'm bruised up from the week. Jesus is going to say, I, I, didn't, I don't want to give you Band-Aids. I, I want to give you love. I want to have a relationship with you. So don't, don't just, again, it's not just about coming when you need Band-Aids. It's, come here. I love you. I, I, I want to have a relationship with you. Remain, 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 remain. Keep showing up. Keep showing up. Keep showing up. Get to church on Sunday. Get in your Bible. Watch the 714. Get on, a, get on the YouVersion Bible app. Remain, 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 remain. In the presence of Jesus, there is fullness of joy. You got to stay in the game. You can't be in and then out, in and then out. It's just not going to work that way. Let me try to give it to you in an illustration. Janelle and I started gardening. God help us all. <laughs> About three years ago. Three years ago, we put seeds in. We were like, we're going to do this. And it was awesome. We got seeds, had this sweet setup, got the egg cartons, put them in, watered them, got them sunlight. <laughs> That's what happened. Nothing. We're like, what? We were so excited. So we're like, oh, well, we learned something. Well, what did we learn? Well, they got to have better sunlight. They got to, oh, okay. So the next year we planted seeds again, sprouts. I'm like, sprouts, sprouts. No fruit. Like they grew, but they didn't grow. You know what I mean? So now we're on the third year. We're looking at each other this year going, this is it. If this doesn't work this year, we're out. We bought raised bed gardens the whole nine. We're like, we are awful gardeners. We're terrible. So I, ta- I literally went to a farmer. I talked to a farmer. I'm like, listen, every year you put seed in the ground like your life depends on it <laughs> because it does. Like, every, you know, so help me understand. He said, Jason, I'll make it really simple. Here's, here's the key. It's all what you feed it and how much sunlight it gets. That's what it boils down to. What do you feed it? How much sunlight does it get? I'm like, I'm like writing stuff down. He's like, really? It's not complicated. I I know, but that was so good. So good. So I wrote it down. So what did we do this year? We fed it. We we fed it. Sunlight. Fed it. Sunlight. Fed it. Again, here we go. Boom. Plants growing up. Fruit sprouting. It's it's like there's fruit. There's good things in the garden now. We're like, oh, my gosh. I have a tomato. (laughs) It grew. Why? Because we showed up every single day. You know what happened when I got busy? And didn't water it, didn't feed it. You know know what happened when when I got busy, didn't take care for it? It withered. It died. This is why Jesus is saying this. He's saying, this is about what you feed it and the access it has to sunlight. You have to remain. We made ourselves a promise. This was our promise to each other. Never miss twice. If I were you today and you want joy, 
I would remember that. I'd write that down. I'd put that in your phone. I would do something to remember that. Because I'm telling you, that's how that garden grew. We knew that we would miss watering it every once in a while. We knew there would be a day we'd get busy and we'd miss watering it. But we heard this phrase and we wrote it down and we've done it ever since then. Never miss twice. Monday, ah, I was busy and I didn't have time to get in God's word. Good, fine, all, all, all fine. Don't miss on Tuesday. Come on, somebody. 714, I didn't get to watch it Tuesday morning. I don't know what happened. Hey, no worries. Get here on Wednesday. Come on, we never miss twice. If I want to go after joy in my life, if I want it back, I've got to choose. I will never miss twice. Sure, I'll miss. Sure, life gets busy. Sure, I'll have to miss, I'll miss a Sunday getting to church or, or I'll miss a small group or I'll miss an opportunity again to spend time in the presence of the Lord. But if I make the choice today to never miss twice, to remain, 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 remain. Just think about the difference it can make in your life today. If you just chose to keep showing up. I'm going to leave you with this passage from Habakkuk because I'm out of time. Habakkuk is going through a really tough season in life, difficult season. Uh, he, he's watched his nation overtaken. He's watched terrible things happening around him. But I want you to listen to his words today because they serve as a great reminder for us about what it means to remain in the midst of difficult seasons, to let all roads lead to Jesus and to remain in Jesus. He said this, Habakkuk 3. Even though the fig tree has no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vine, even though the olive crop has failed and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. That's got an exclamation point on it. So I said it really loud because that's what he said. He said, even though, even though, even though, even though, I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll find joy in Jesus because this situation, all roads will lead me to Jesus. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. Come on, somebody, that's good news. God is after your joy today. As we wrap this up, do me a favor, just right now, bow your heads, close your eyes in this moment. This is my question for you today as we close this out. Will I let anxious thoughts, deferred hopes, or a wondering heart destroy me today, or will I let it deepen me today? Will I let it destroy my joy, or will I let it deepen my joy today. The choice is this. All roads can lead me to Jesus. Every road that leads to Jesus leads me to joy.